Hi, I'm Dan Krinas, host of the Leader of Learning podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to another great episode of My Ed Tech Life. That's right. It is Tuesday morning. And like I mentioned yesterday, we are on vacation. So what better way to use our time wisely than to have some amazing shows with some amazing guests? And today is definitely no exception. But before we get started, as always, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for making My Ed Tech Life what it is today. As you know, our mission, our vision, and our passion is to connect educators and creators one show at a time. So thank you for all of you, our listeners, our viewers, those of you that will be joining us live. Thank you, as always, from the bottom of my heart for your support. And I'm really excited about today's show because we'd have two amazing authors that have been doing some amazing work within this past year whom I've been following you know, through, you know, pandemic and so on. And now, you know, they're definitely out there getting a new book out uh, recently, and they'll be talking about that. But I'm just really excited about today's topic. And let me go ahead and welcome them to the show. So we'll go ahead and start here with Zach. Zach, how are you doing this morning? Hey, I'm, I'm very good. Thanks for having us. Excellent. So, Zach, before we kind of get started with the whole conversation, could you give us a little brief introduction and your context in education? Sure. Yeah. Um, like you said, my name is Zach Brando. Um, I'm a fourth grade teacher um, in Troy, Michigan, which is just outside of Detroit. Um, I've taught third and fourth grade, but mostly have been in fourth grade. And I just finished up my ninth year of teaching. Um, and this has been a a busy morning, as you said, we got a new book out. So I just like came straight from an elementary school and I just did an author visit with our new book and a reading um, to a bunch of K through uh, kindergarten through fifth graders this morning. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Zach. I really appreciate it. And next up, we have Grayson McKinney. Grayson, how are you doing this morning? Hi, thank you so much for having fun. Um, I love seeing all of the comments rolling in. You've got viewers from all over the country, Texas, New Jersey, Arizona. I'm in Michigan uh, with Zach. My name is Grayson McKinney. And uh, together, yes, as Zach said, we are the co-authors of now two books. Um, the first one came out last May, and it's called The Expert Effect, a three-part system to break down the walls of your classroom and connect your students to the world. And, uh, and then we just released our picture book, a classroom companion that teachers can use to help launch project-based learning and all kinds of things like that. So we're excited to talk with you on your show today about our, our approach to education. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And again, yes, a big shout out to Alex Isaacs. We've got John Woodward. We've got Lois Alston. Uh, she'll be on the show actually tomorrow also. And then Roxy Thompson. Thank you so much. You guys are all amazing. Uh, so yes, so I'm really excited about what you talked about today and what we're about to dive into. But before that, as you all know, what I love to do is I love to connect my guests uh, with our audience members. And, you know, kind of like everybody, like every superhero has an origin story. We all know that as educators, we all have an origin story. Some may have been maybe a conventional, you know, story as we kind of go straight through and knowing that we wanted to go into education all along. Uh, but for others, it was maybe kind of like that little fork in the road moment, or maybe we were denying our calling until we just landed into it. So I'm curious, gentlemen, and we'll go ahead and start with Grayson first. Tell us a little bit about your background in education. Was it something that you really wanted to do, or is it something that came on later in life? So, um, I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan, East Grand Rapids, and where my mom was a school social worker. Um, and so I grew up in a household where, um, you know, we were always in schools. We were always visiting even before I was in my own school. Um, I remember going with her to, uh, you know, the school carnival nights and, you know, helping her pack up her office uh, every summer. And so, like, I kind of grew up in schools even before my own educational journey began. And so uh, when it was time to like start thinking about that kind of thing, I think I was in high school. Um, my 
my high school offered like a, uh, an internship, like a student teaching opportunity for credits where you could go into one of our local elementary schools and help out a teacher. And I went into a fourth grade class there, Mrs. Follett, who actually had been my fourth grade teacher when I was in elementary school. And I just remember like helping her in the classroom, getting to know the kids, uh, playing Pokemon, the trading card game with these students and just like just loving the atmosphere, the energy. And so, yeah, I would say I, I definitely followed the traditional route of education. Um, I, I knew right away, you know, I did lots of, um, you know, para educational things like uh, running summer science camps for kids. Uh, I was an, uh, a summer camp counselor uh, the year between my senior year of high school and freshman year of college. So I was always, always having fun with kids and wanting to do like those fun and adventurous things. And when it came time to like choose a major, I knew elementary education was my my priority. And that's luckily where I've been for most of my career. I just ended my 15th year of teaching. I've taught everything from kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, at one point, I was an elementary Spanish teacher teaching uh, <laughs> kindergartners, you know, some just basic Spanish. I'm, I'm not fluent at all. But uh, anyway, I've been teaching fifth grade for the last five years and found my sweet spot. The upper elementary uh, age group is, is where I, I thrive. So excellent. Well, thank you for sharing. And much like you. Actually, I, I started off in high school algebra for three years and I moved down to elementary and it was always sixth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, fifth grade. And I really loved, like you mentioned, it really was a sweet spot where I was able to really hone in a lot of skills. And what I loved is when I moved into elementary was that I had the students year round. When I was in high school, since we had block schedule, I had the students just for, you know, half of the semester and then they're out. And so it was going way too fast. But elementary. Definitely great. Never got to do junior high, but I hear some great things about junior high. <laughs> uh, so uh, bless those junior high teachers uh, that are, you know, with the, the junior high kiddos during that age. But hey, we all have a calling and definitely that upper elementary. I agree with you. It is a really, really great sweet spot. And congratulations. Congratulations also on the 15th years that you've completed. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say the only the only tough thing, um, our elementary school is kindergarten through fifth grade. And so at the end of the year, unlike all the other grade levels, we, we don't get to see them in the hallways after that because they do move on to middle school. So it, it's kind of, I understand that feeling of like, oh, it's too gone too soon. So, um, but luckily we get, we get a lot that come back to visit Mr. Rondo and Mr. McKinney at our school, which is uh, Costello Elementary. Shout out to Costello. <laughs> all right, shout out to Costello. Uh, Grayson, we'll go, I mean, excuse me, Zach, I apologize. Let's go on to you. Can you give us a little bit uh, of a background here as far as your origin story in education? Sure. So I know it's a cliche. A lot of people say like um, your parents or grandparents were your first teachers. Well, my mom and my grandma were literally my first teachers because they have owned, um, my grandma and mom started a preschool um, about 38 or 39 years ago now. Um, so when I, my very first experiences of going to a school were my mom and my grandma being my, my two teachers there. Um, so I've had a lot of education background and influence through that. I have, um, an aunt who has been a third and fourth grade teacher forever. And I used to go in and help her set up, um, her classroom as well, sometimes in the summer. Um, but I was definitely not that kid who was like setting up their stuffed animals to play school, um, in their basement. I really didn't growing up, I didn't have the idea that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, I specifically remember a time sitting in a high school math class, seeing a teacher get frustrated, probably rightfully so with behaviors and stuff and thinking like, why would anyone want to be a math teacher? Fast forward a little bit. Now math is like my favorite subject to teach. Um, so I kind of bridged that gap between not knowing I wanted to be a teacher and becoming that was working in day camps. Um, right after I graduated high school, I worked at a day camp working with third and fourth grade students. And then I, the next summer worked at another day camp, was a counselor there and then became a director of it for two or three years. Um, and I always worked with third and fourth grade students. And right then and there, um, like Grayson kind of said, it was like playing all the games, like doing all the fun stuff and just seeing their energetic personalities and playfulness. Um, that's when I, when I really realized that I wanted to be a teacher and going into my freshman year of college, I did start taking like the introductory to education classes. So I started right away in college and I, um, went, went through it all. And I got to student teach at my, 
um, at the middle school I went to, it became a K through eight school. So I got to go back and I got to student teach with a lot of my former teachers and like seeing them and sitting in on staff meetings and seeing them was always like kind of a <laughs> first surreal, um, behind the curtain opportunity, seeing it behind the curtains. So then one more quick story is that going after I graduated college, you know, it was, um, it was a lot harder about nine years ago to get education jobs. I went through interview after interview after interview. And then on the second day of the school year, I had started the year as a, like a paraprofessional, um, in a school. And then I got a call and I had to go in and teach a lesson. So I walked into Grayson's classroom to teach my lesson. He was one of the people in the background taking notes about my lesson. Um, and it, it went well. And the next day we were fourth grade, uh, teaching partners. So we work at the same school just down the hallway from each other. Ooh, that is wonderful. And so I love that then that connection that you guys made. And uh, Zach, also, I can relate to you that when I first started in education and kind of actually seeing things like behind the curtains, the way things go, because I started having some of my former teachers that I started were coming to our district. And I was like, whoa, this is so weird, but I totally understand that feeling. But this is great. You know, that connection that you have made, you know, working alongside each other and really honing in those skills. And what I love, and first of all, what I want to commend you all is that, you know, that working together uh, is very important. And the fact that you're not, I guess, in your silos, but you're actively, you know, sharing with one another what works, what may not work. And that's the whole thing that I love about the story of how this book came about, that it's not just, well, here I kind of tried this out and this worked, but this was you both putting, you know, the time and the effort into making sure that what you are sharing is something that can, number one, be done by teachers, and number two, is something that can easily you know, be implemented by teachers as well, because you guys have lived it. So let's go ahead and get started here with Zach first. So we're going to be talking about the expert effect, and it's really connecting learning to the real world. And as a teacher growing up, I mean, as a student growing up, I always heard, well, you're always going to need this in the real world. And, I'm, you know, as a student, you're always like, well, when am I ever going to need this? Oh, you will. Trust me, you will. But those are the answers that we always got, but there was never a follow through as far as, well, let me show you how this would work. There was never that connection to the outside world of actually seeing how am I going to be using mathematics in the future? And I joke around with our, our math content specialist because a lot of people are like, ah, I'll never use math. And then I'll show him pictures of my doctoral studies homework where I'm doing stats. And I said, dude, whoever says you're never going to need yeah. math was totally wrong. And, you know, but what I, what I would kind of want to get to is I think a lot of students miss out on so much and teachers can miss out on so much in using not only the subject matter experts within your building, but the subject matter experts that are in your community. So I want to get your take as far as how the book came about maybe and giving us some of, uh, you know, that background and some of the things that you went and dove into to make this book come to fruition and, of course, to sharpen your practice. So let's go ahead and start with Zach here first. So a little bit of the backstory of how this book came to be was a really, really unique experience that Grace and I shared. It was my um, fourth year teaching, I believe. We were the only two fourth grade teachers in, in our school. So it was just two sections and our classrooms were right next to each other. And in between our classrooms, it takes this like janitorial tool, but you can take it out and you can remove the wall and move it all the way back. So our principal went and visited this uh, school in Missouri and all of their classrooms were two teachers um, and a larger number of kids in a classroom co-teaching. So she approached us with the idea and said, you're the only two this year. You have the perfect room. We can take out the wall. Like, wh what do you guys think? Do you want to try it? So um, we, we dove right in. We tried it um, right away. So for one full school year, we had 56 fourth graders and one huge class with the two of us um, and a student teacher uh, who is now a colleague of ours um, in this room. So at first it was like a very like, Oh my gosh, the way we always taught is not going to work teaching 56 kids at once. So that year was like this huge year of experimentation with um, pulling a lot of small groups 
instead of doing direct instruction and then testing, we like threw away a lot of the, the test manuals. We had the freedom to do that. And we did a lot of project-based learning. And we realized that we needed kids either working, if they chose to work by themselves, fine. If they wanted to work in a group, fine. But we needed to find a way that we could have our classroom running where it wasn't them, you know, 50 plus kids having to listen to us all day long. So we would teach many lessons. We would do direct instruction. Um, we recorded a lot of lessons so they could listen to it at their own pace on their iPads. And then we took off with project-based learning. So in that year, we tried all of these new things. And one of the most successful things we tried was um, at this time in using Skype. And we would get people to Skype in with our students and um, teach them. And we found that once students saw this work, like somebody who does this work and uses this knowledge every, every day, it that was the connection point you were talking about, where it was like, oh, people do do this. Oh, I could maybe do that. Like, maybe that's something I want to do. Or even if it was someone they didn't necessarily connect to, they could still see like, oh, okay, I can't say who's going to use this because I just talked to somebody who, <laughs> who does use this. Um, so sure. Grace, I'm going to pass it over to you if I missed anything or if you want to talk about the three three parts we came up with. All right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so as Fonz, you were saying like, you know, breaking it down and connecting it to the real world, I'll share an Easter egg. In the subtitle of our book, it says, break down the walls of your classroom and connect your students to the world. And so that was happening happening literally we literally had to break down the wall in order to make this like huge learning space um but then the other thing was yeah breaking down the silos that you that you mentioned like getting getting bringing in people from our community people who know way more than us or people whose passions you know is geology and has a rock collection you know when 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 you're able to like tap into other people's and this this is true for adults and for students if you're able to tap into their passions and get them talking about something that they really care about the the impact and the lasting memory of that experience is going to be so so much greater for everybody and so when we're able to find somebody who has written a book or has the rock collection or um you know knows marketing and like can talk to kids about you know writing a persuasive uh you know elevator sales pitch and gets them talking to to the students it's just so much more impactful as t i think teachers are the first expert right teachers are the ones who know their students Teachers are the ones who know the the content standards they have to cover in the in the curriculum that they're going to use to get there, but it's it's really important also for teachers to be um, willing and to take the risk and reach out and ask say ask people and say, I have these kids who want to learn about this. Are you able to like come and talk to us either in person or virtually for for a, a short amount of time and then continue to circle back to that um, expertise throughout the unit or throughout the project so that um, it it makes a deep impact on what they're doing. Excellent. Yeah. And I agree with you on that. Now, I love that story. You know, you just broke down those walls. You became one class and you collaborated. The students really just enjoyed that. You made those connections, getting out of those silos. And, you know, in, in my experience, you know, and I'm going to be honest, you know, in my experience is you rarely, rarely saw a teacher that would love to share their stuff. I mean, they get out of the copy room and they just be holding on to those things and no, no, like, don't look at what I am doing. And I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, these are our students. These are our kids, you know, together combined. So we want to always, you know, do what's best. And so those are some of the things that even unfortunately uh, till now we, we are still seeing, but I'm glad that there are teachers and pockets of innovators such as yourself that are breaking down those barriers and sharing an example of the the positive that can come out from true collaboration and really working well together because it creates that memorable learning experience, like you mentioned. And of course, tapping in to what is in your community. And my last couple of years in the elementary classroom in fifth grade, that was one of the highlights that I would tap in and I would actually call parents to come in mm -hmm. because a lot of it was parent involvement and some of the parents, you know, worked in certain areas, certain businesses that tied into what we were currently doing and what we were teaching in the classroom. And just to bring in those parents and get them involved, I mean, it, it just really created a wonderful culture in the classroom. It just really just the students did not want to miss school. So our definitely uh, attendance rates were definitely a lot higher. So. I mean, if we could just see that at that greater scale, 
you know, create that excitement that we always talk about. These are some simple ways of doing that. So I'm just really excited about what you're doing and what you're sharing here. So talk to us a little bit, though, uh, as far as, you know, I can see this happening, possibly, you know, it's you two being very innovative kind of, you know, your administrator said, okay, let's kind of go ahead and go do this. I want to know what was the reaction of some of the teachers there that may have been the, those types of teachers that this is the way I've always done it and don't come stirring things up. Did you guys get any kind of backlash from that? So we'll start with Grayson here first. So um, the summer after our principal had visited that uh, innovative school in Missouri, um, she came back, talked to us about it. And we always have those bubble grades. So it's like, you know, sometimes there will be three sections and sometimes there will be two. So we actually had another pair of teachers um, that we had a pair of second grade teachers who tried the, the same thing. And, um, you know, it was great to have another uh, another pair of co-teachers to bounce ideas off of. Um, it was at a time when like flexible seating was was coming into vogue. And so we were you know, talking about what furniture we were using, we were getting our, our custodians to adjust the table height so we could have standing desks and desks on the floor with cushions. And we were just trying, we were trying everything and just seeing what, what worked and what, uh, what didn't work. So it was nice to have other colleagues who were, who were in a similar experience. Um, as Zach said, it was only one year um, because of those, the numbers of, uh, of our enrollment, we had more sections and didn't want to leave another classroom teacher out. And so we haven't done it again. Um, I did try to convince him just recently we were going to get four sections of, of fifth grade. I was like, come up to fifth grade. You can you can do it. We, we can do this again. Recreate the the magic and uh, couldn't convince him. He's, he loves fourth grade. He, he's got a great, great team of, of colleagues. But um, our school is really supportive. Um, you know, the biggest one of the biggest challenges we had was just from the sheer volume of people in the classroom was the noise level, um, not because kids were out of control or, you know, bouncing off the walls but just when you, when if you have 58 people even talking at a conversational level it can it could get quite quite loud so we had to come up with some systems to um to work through that and as Zach said you know recording lessons um we had to adapt and 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 pre-record lessons kind of doing like a modified flipped classroom um where kids were able to access that content with headphones and and um and rewatched at home with with parents um we got a lot of positive feedback about that because parents could see this new math that we were doing and you know they could see the the step-by-step -step thing and everything was on their um ipads we should mention that too we were a one-to-one -one school with ipads so that that was helpful um but yeah our school has been always been supportive of new ideas and innovative approaches excellent zach how about your take on it what was your the first impression you know going through this and finishing your first year did you you know, maybe some barriers that maybe Grayson didn't see, but maybe you did, you know, can, can you share a little bit with that? Yeah, we definitely became like a, uh, a, a fishbowl classroom. We had a lot of district level administrators coming in and out and we had a lot of teachers coming in and out and just like, whoa, how is this going to work? Like, um, no, no one was like ne negative to us or not, but a lot, a lot of people came in and just were like, yeah, I give you credit. I don't think, I don't, I don't know if I would necessarily try that. Um, and one thing, if someone's listening to this and wants like thinking about bringing that idea to their school, I, I don't think it could be a system where you just like take two teachers and throw them together and make them do this. I think it has to be like, you know, a good mix of personalities and people who are willing, um, willing to do it. I, I think, um, you know, one thing we share that example in our book of that co-teaching, but everything we learned that year, like I still use as a solo classroom teacher. It's not that these um, tactics only worked if you had, you know, 60 people in a room. Um, a lot of the stuff we did was getting connect, like I said earlier, connecting our students with experts, getting our students to create project-based learning, and then getting them to share their work with the world, which is the three parts of our book. And that came out of that year, but it's something that I use all the time as a solo um, teacher as well. Excellent. And see, and that's what I love that what you are doing doesn't necessarily have to be like you mentioned that model mm -hmm. that you guys started with, but it could be something that could be used as a solo teacher. And that's great. You know, the ability to adapt, improvise, you know, and overcome those barriers with what you're sharing and still be able to use it and be effective as a solo teacher. That's great. And that's what I love 
about what you're sharing. So I kind of want to continue with that conversation here as far as let's go into there will be many first year teachers that will be starting this year, you know, so let's say if you can go back to your first year you knowing what you know now and and i definitely want you to tap into what you have in the book what would be a great starting point for a teacher that is coming in and really has that forward thinking that vision you know that 10x i'd say that they really want to go all out and you know start with connecting the students to actually making it meaningful learning, connecting the, what they're doing to real world. So we'll go back and forth. So we'll start with Zach first. What would be some of your best advice based on what you have shared in your writings for a first year teacher looking to just really amplify their their teaching? Mm -hmm. um, I think whether you're a first year teacher or even a first year in a new grade level, I think that first year is so important to just learn and understand um, the content that you're teaching um, without trying to uh, reinvent every part of it. That first year, you got to understand like the flow of your units, the flow of the year and how it goes. But for a first year teacher or first year in a new grade level, as you're starting to look at what new things you're teaching, just asking yourself and thinking about which experts can I connect my students with, whether that's a virtual field trip um, that's like you know, there's many different forms of this. There's virtual field trips. A lot of them are pre-recorded. It's just like watching a YouTube video, but it's a little bit more engaging where you can pause and you can talk. Um, since, you know, this whole pandemic and COVID, so many different organizations have digital content now because that was the only way to reach people for, um, you know, that first full year. And then you can look for places that do live um, virtual field trips. Many museums and places do that where you can sign up. You have a guide and it's much more personal where it's like the guide talking to your class. Your class can go up on to the, up to the camera microphone um, and ask questions. And then just looking for if there's experts like around your community based on what you're doing. Or like you said, tapping into your community. Um, I'm going to share one example. It's Grayson's example, but we do this weather unit and a student in Grayson's class, his aunt worked for the National Weather Channel. So they Skyped in and gave the students a whole um, tour. So just looking for opportunities to connect students to real experts is a pretty simple way to just enhance any unit or content that, that you're teaching. That'd be my, my advice. Excellent. Grayson, how about yourself? What would be some of the best tips that you can give based on your experience and what you're sharing in the book? Um, like, as you said, one of the best places to start is to start close to home and like just reach out to the parents that are in your classroom. And as you as Zach said, look at the units that are coming up and say like, hey, um, families, we are going to be learning about journalism in the next month, uh, next four to six weeks. And so if you know anybody who works at a newspaper, magazine, radio station, we would love to talk with them and like just put it out to your parents because you never know uh, what connections you can find. Um, that, that's been one of my most successful units. Um, apparently everybody knows somebody in, in journalism. <laughs> We've got <laughs> so many good, um, connections to people who work, you know, so we're in Michigan. So at the Detroit free press, uh, the Detroit news, we've talked with people from the pure Michigan campaign, uh, which is like our, our state's tourism, uh, tour, tourism initiative to get people to come and visit the great lake state. Um, we've talked to, um, Rebecca Hersher of NPR through the uh, Pulitzer Center for um, Education. Uh, she runs the, or she at one point did the NPR Science Desk. And so just like there's, there's so many, so many people who are out there and with not only that, but knowledgeable and exciting to talk to, but also willing to talk to kids. Um, you know, when you were talking about the copy room situation with people, you know, hoarding their master copies and, and hustling out with everything underneath their arms it kind of made me think about like the, that mindset. We really have to move away from the mindset of like, I created this, this is mine. And, um, you know, thinking that other people will feel the same. Teachers have to be willing to, um, you know, cold call, cold call these people or just send, send emails out because, um, you know, the worst that you, they can say is no, but chances are they will say yes. People love working with uh, with students. They feel like it's it's meaningful for them to give back to the community. It's a great way for them to, um, you know, plug their business or or get good PR. 
Um, you know, being in Detroit, we've got tons of families who are working for the uh, big three automotive. You know, we've got robotics, we've got engineers, we've got all kinds of people. And to get that, you know, to tell their company, hey, I'm going to go out to this elementary school and talk about, uh, you know, our robotics program. That's great for them. And so people people want to give back. People want to share. So, um, you know, you may have had an experience with that where teachers aren't necessarily willing to, but it's not always the same outside of education. Uh, so that would be my my advice is start start small, start close to home, but then dream big of like, who can we reach out to uh, to make these memorable learning experiences? I agree. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think I'll also I'd like to add to that is not only connecting with your community, but as an educator, connect with other educators that are out there that are doing some innovative things, just such as Grayson, such as Zach. Uh, I did share their their Twitter handles. And then, of course, uh, in the show, in the show notes, you'll find other ways that you can connect with them. But I think for myself, too, as an educator, I, I never want to dismiss that, that social media, although a lot of times it does have a bad rap because of what you may see. But if I'm just there for the education content, which I really am, and uh, finding wonderful educators that are doing some great things, I definitely want to connect with them and learn from them and see what it is that they're doing in their classrooms and how I can, it, you know, adapt that into my classroom setting. So if you may not be able to find something specifically within your current school building, reach out and tap, tap, you know, these wonderful educators and they're always willing to help and just drop them a DM, send them an email. And I guarantee you that, you know, you'll, you'll be surprised how quickly they reply because everybody wants to help everybody. So that's definitely something that's great there. All right. So, oh, just add on one more thing, because um, we, we did the same thing um, using social media, like reaching out to our favorite ed tech companies, like companies like Seesaw, or uh, Flipgrid, we've like talked to like the the core team members. We've talked to Joey from Flipgrid. We've we've sat in on webinars from Seesaw about um, you know creating a website or create you know programming and things like that. So we've gotten our kids to learn from um, our our idols, like you said, the superhero. <laughs> you have superhero uh, education league, like Justice League. We we've, we've got our uh, pantheon of of ed tech companies that we've reached out to, and they're always willing to help. It seems. That is definitely a great tip. Uh, definitely. So reach out to them because you'd be surprised. And and I've heard that several times over too, you know, with people that are doing conferences or will do something online op for teachers too. But I mean, the companies are willing to, you know, send their A-team to do a virtual training. So, I mean, they're definitely going to be willing to send their A-team to speak to students because it's all about preparing students for the future of learning and the future of work. And, you know, it's interesting that I've been reading this book and it, it okay, so I'm going to go ahead and show it here because this is something that I have to do for one of my courses. And it's really just talking about incident. It, it just coincidentally fell into really connecting the, what's in the classroom to what is in the real world and how we may not be doing such a great or a great job at doing that because we always give those same answers of, well, just because. Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to learn it? Well, because I said so. No, no. Like, you know, if you explain to a student and you share with them what that entails, and then they also see that representation. I, I think for myself as a big STEM proponent and, um, you know, girl, girls who code and women in STEM and, you know, for anybody here, I think one of the biggest things was bringing in people into the classroom, bringing in these experts that a student of mine can say, wow, I had never seen, a, you know, a Hispanic scientist. You know, I had never seen a woman chemist and they make those connections and say, hey, like what I'm learning now is something that can definitely lead me into this career path that I love because they see themselves represented in that. And I think, you know, oh. what you're what you're doing here is something that's great, too, as well. I'm sorry, who wanted to, Did you want to add something to that, Zach? Uh, no, I didn't. Have it. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought I heard somebody. That's so important. That's yeah, I said it's representation is so important. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we we talk about that too. And you know, some of these um, platforms have even gone so far as to when you're reaching out in order to schedule, like you know, Skype a scientist. I I believe, uh, you know, you can talk about which science discipline uh, your your students are learning about, and then also you can you can say, I would love to have talk to a Hispanic scientist or uh, you know African American scientist, 
and they'll do their best to accommodate that so that you, whoever your students are can see that. And we, you know, Zach and I say that point blank. We say as two, uh, you know, cisgender white males, like we do not look like our students. And so it's our job to um, to incorporate that diversity into the not only what we're teaching, but how we're teaching it as well. Excellent. Great point. Zach, let me go ahead and bring you on here. And then that way you can talk to us now about the new book that you're putting out. I know you just said that you just came from a reading. So I'm really excited. I mean, you had the expert effect and now you've got this uh, book that goes right along with it. Tell us a little bit about what the, the, you know, the content of the book, what the mission and goal is for this project here. Mm -hmm. So like you said, this is the expert expedition and it is um, it's a companion book to the expert effects, but can also be used as a standalone read aloud, uh, standalone read aloud to any classroom. So when we wrote the expert effect, obviously our audience was teachers and, but the main goal was to get, you know, inspire teachers to change what they do, which ultimately impacts kids. So in writing the expert expedition, we wanted to just kind of maybe cut out that whole middle part and just give the message right to the students themselves. Um, so. The Expert Expedition is a rhyming picture book, um, and its goal is much as the same as we're inspiring students to, you know, chase their passions, follow their dreams, dream big, encourage them to um, learn from experts out, outside of just their teacher, like tap into that, learn from people. We want them to create something with their learning. So we encourage them, maybe you're creating a podcast or a website. Um, or you're presenting to people or doing a keynote speech. And then third wing, you know, encourage them to take what they're doing and get it out to get it out to the world. You can't keep your, your learning just hidden in your head. We have to get it out there, um, and share with the world ultimately to make the world a better place. Um, my absolute favorite thing is we are artists. Soraya Ali Ahmed is just like brilliant. I'll just, just flip to a random page. HW, like her artwork is just like this mix of fantasy wow. and whimsicalness, and she did this all, all by hand the entire book. Um, so seeing it come to life and the whole process has, has been really, really special. And it just came out in May, um, so it's just over a month old now. Excellent. Well, thank you so much there. And Grayson, if you want, can you add a little bit more into that? So um, the origin story for the picture book is is amazing as well. So Zach and I last summer, um, we participated in this sixth through 12th grade um, uh, summer learning camp. It was called the Oakland Youth Innovation Lab. And the whole premise was um, asking students to think about how can we how can we get them to use their voice to create a more just society? And you know, they came to us just like students do every year with their own individual, unique um, passions, talents, and interests that they wanted to learn more about. So we had students coming in who wanted to combine their love of baking with saving the sea turtles. And we had students who came in with, a, you know, a really deep understanding of, of coding, and they wanted to help fix the problem of um, pollution in their community. And so like we had, you know, you take what they love and take what they want to do. And we had to find a way to put them together. And that's actually where we met our illustrator because she's a, she's a, a secondary English teacher in our district. Um, but we had never met her before, but she was one of these uh, learning guides. And the three of us were talking and were just like so geeked about this experience for the kids. <laughs> and we started, you know, we shared that our book at that time had just come out about a month ago. And we're like, yeah, you know, we've we've always wanted to make this picture book. You know, we were inspired by um, uh, like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to blank on his name. The Energy Bus. Zach John was, Gordon. Thank you. John Gordon wrote The Energy Bus for adults. But then he also wrote a, a children's companion book, The Energy Bus for Kids. And we're like, that would be like the perfect way to get our message to um, to students. And so we were doing this. We were going on field trips with our kids. We were talking to, uh, you know, taking them down to Eastern Market in Detroit, talking to the community gardeners who were trying to, um, you know, end, end uh, food, food insecurity in Detroit and like getting our kids to learn from these people, getting them to create something with their own passions. And then at the end, we had a showcase where they were able to share their share their projects with the world. And so this um, this innovation lab like ran in the same um, the same footprints as the expert effect. And it was just like this amazing thing. And so the picture book came out of that experience and all of the illustrations, which are beautiful, were also inspired by actual things that our 
our students, either mine, Zach's or Soraya's have actually done in their own learning. So it's, 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 it's a mixture of fantasy, but the, the impact, it has been real. So that's that great. Yeah. That is wonderful. That is such a great story. And I mean, just the importance that you guys have mentioned, you know, just amplifying student voice. And, you know, I know we say that often, but it just seems like, you know, it, I, we still may not see it so much in the classroom, but just the fact that you're out there doing this and just really listening to students and just, I, I love that, you know, they can think of those things like you said, the love of baking and all of that, just combining that. And I'm just, that's really exciting because that's creativity. And for myself, it's oftentimes what I see is like, you know, from third grade on, as soon as start, you know, state testing begins, it's like that creativity is just kind of like, you know, it's not there, you know, it's like, Hey, we got to get ready for the test and we don't have enough time to be creative. But I mean, it's just a great outlet for students and I mean, even for teachers. And I love the passion that you're bringing, you know, as you're describing this, I'm like, this is wonderful. And this is definitely something worth having to share. And so I'm really excited about that. All right, gentlemen. Well, as we wrap up, we're getting closer to the end of the show. I do want to thank you for just the amazing shares, the passion, the heart that you guys put into your book and oh, your books now, and just the vision that you have and how it all started with just down the walls like I mean literally breaking down a classroom wall and you know working together and that took off into what it is today so I really want to thank you for that because we definitely need more of that experience that your expertise to get out there and so definitely make sure that you guys pick up these books and you can definitely find them on Edumatch Publishing and you'll get all those links too as well at the end of the show notes uh, but Grayson, Zach, we are down to the last three questions here that I always ask my guests. So we'll go ahead and alternate here. That way we can get your responses. But here is the first question, and we'll go ahead and start with Zach first. Zach, in the current state of education, what would you say is your current edu kryptonite? Yes. Um, the one I'm I'm gonna say that just kind of like weighs me down and just it's always hard for me uh, to wrap my head around is all of the like documenting and progress monitoring that we need to do on students. Um, and I fully understand the point and the intent of doing that and making sure we're, we're checking in with those learners and doing that. But I always feel like I worked with the kid and then I want to work with more, but I have to take like the time to like write out what I did and mark off that the lesson was done. Um, so that's, that's always been something that I, I, struggle with. It's not my favorite thing to do in education. All right. Thank you. Grayson, we turn it over to you. What is your current edu kryptonite? So as you were, I mean, you, you set it up perfectly. You're saying, you know, we've, we've got our kids doing all these projects, learning in a way that that's meaningful to them, connecting their passions with what we have to teach anyway. But then we hit the state, the state standardized testing window. And it's kind of, I was mountain biking with my two sons last night and we were at a, on a trail that had a very uh some thick sand and it was like we were going going and then we hit the sand and like completely slow down you lose you lose the momentum you lose the energy and I, to me that's kind of what um uh right after spring break <laughs> we come back and we've got our uh michigan m step and it kind of like slows the train and that's that's kind of like kryptonite for me there you go. Good answer. Excellent. All right, gentlemen, we'll start with Grayson this time. If you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it be and why? Um, for this, I'm going to use a quote from our book, which is, if you give students the chance to amaze you, they usually will. So we have to, we have to be willing to um, give up a little bit of our control and um, you know, kind of go with the um, the ideas that kids bring because it's there. I mean, that's what made me fall in love with education in the be to begin with is like their energy, their excitement. And if you can um, tap into that and and get them get them learning in a way that is meaningful to them, you will be amazed at what they can come up with. Um, I'll, uh, a quick analogy: my my wife is running her her district special education extended school year this summer, so I've we've got three children, so I'm at home with them, and we were doing um, lunch the other day. And my daughter opened a container of uh, yogurt and she's three years old. And so I got her a spoon. She was trying to eat the yogurt and she just was not not being very successful with this this yogurt. And I was like, kind of like, all right, well, we're not going to waste food. Got to eat the yogurt. 
And she was sitting there kind of like pushing back on the spoon, did not want to do it. I was like, okay, well, do you want a straw? And she got a straw and she drank the uh, entire container of yogurt. And it got me thinking like, you know what? Sometimes we're trying to feed kids with the spoon and what they need is a straw. So we need to find a way to, you know, still get get our message across, but we have to do it in a way that that allows them to do it in a, a way where they'll be successful. And here she is. Say hi. hi. Hey, how are you? Do you want to say hi? Oh, all right, Grayson. Well, you know what? Thank you so much. That was just Oof, mind blowing for me. Like the way you say, you know, we're trying to feed them with the spoon, but they really need a straw. They need an alternative. They need a way for them to consume it in a way that makes sense to them, in a way that they're comfortable with, in a way that they get it. And oftentimes, you know, as teachers, and and albeit like myself, you know, when I first started, you know, again coming from a non traditional background in education, but it was always like, well, no, this is the way it's always been done. This is the way it's always been taught. And later, I learned, like, wow, like. This this mentality, you know, definitely needs to change. And as soon as I kind of opened that up and said, okay, you know, I'm I'm selling this to my customers and they're not all going to buy it the same way, it really made a world of a difference where instead of just force feeding it with the spoon, they had different options, whatever made them feel most comfortable with. So thank you for sharing. That was a great, great uh, story. Zach, on to you. What would your billboard say? You, you teed this one up perfectly for me. Mine, I wrote this down. It says, uh, the way it's always been done isn't the way it has to be done in the future. So I think we need to get out of that mindset and, you know, try new ways. And a lot of times when we try new ways, it, it doesn't work the first time, but that new way can lead us to a different, um, way of thinking and just continuing to iterate on our, on our practice and grow over time, um, in ways that we know is best for students. Excellent. Great. Great answers, gentlemen. And the last question, this is a first for me because this is the first time that I do this segment with two other guests and asking this question, usually it's just one other guest. So this is a first for me where I get two questions asked. So um, the last question, if this was the Expert Effect podcast and I get to be a guest on your show, Grayson and Zach, and you had one question to ask me, what question would that be? I'll go ahead and start with Zach this time. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote this down as we were talking. I would love to know how your transition from um, classroom teacher to district level um, tech integration, how that's gone for you. All right. That's a great question. Actually, it's been very, it's been great. You know, it has been a whirlwind of a difference or a whirlwind of a change just due to the fact that, you know, honing in your skills with fifth and sixth graders and, you know, doing all of those things, moving to the district level. Now you're working with teachers. So with teachers, we have walls or different walls that we need to break down you know, much like you mentioned in the book, you know, and really it's just for myself, what I strive to work for the most is that relationship and that psychological safety that for a lot of teachers, they may not be used to uh, having that safety net where, hey, you know what, if I make a mistake, they're not going to judge me or they're not going to get mad or anything. For myself, it's the, the whole purpose of the training is number one, build that rapport, that psychological safety, that if they make a mistake on a click, I always say, hey, just get clicky with it. You're not going to break anything. Hit back, refresh, log out, log back in, and you're good and you're solid. And just, you know, giving them that safety that they can go out and experiment, much like I did with my fifth and sixth grade students. So it has been great. It It is been a little bit tough as far as sometimes a lot of the things when state testing comes around, usually, you know, from January to like about May, it's kind of like all hands off the deck. In other words, we, we just want our teachers to focus on testing. And like Grayson said, it's kind of like that trail of sand really, you know, uh, we're kind of stuck, you know, if, if we have to really go into star or star mode. And we really don't get to bring in those creative components into the classroom to share with teachers so they can put it in the students' hands because it's that focus. So, but like I said, there is a lot of upside to it, which is number one, the impact on teachers is great. Being able to build that relationship and that rapport with them and just to put a couple of tech tools in their hands that can give them more time at the end of the day, even if it's just to sit down 
lights off and just breathe and reflect, that to me is always a win. So it's been great. All right, Zach, on to you for your question. <laughs> so I was wondering, um, you know, I, I hear that this is your vacation and yet here we are. So how do you recharge? How do you, what do you do to um, replenish your own stores of energy? Excellent. Well, actually, you know, the funny thing is, is that this is the way that I replenish that, you know, I, I know a lot of people may say, well, what do you mean? Like you're working, you're doing this, but like, for me, this is my passion. This is what drives me. I, I'm literally like, I consider myself a lifelong learner. And for myself, when I learn something new, it's almost like my battery gets full, having conversations, hearing your stories and all the guests stories. It really fills my heart and it really pumps me up that after I finish a, a show, I'm really like on cloud nine and I am ready to tackle that honeydew list and it's go time. And so it, it, it's funny that I work that way. I do take some breaks and I do disconnect, uh, but it's. I don't know. Sometimes I just feel a little bit more tired when I'm not doing anything. So as far as vacation time, being able to podcast and being able to learn, to me, this is my time for professional development, like I mentioned, and we get to share it with the world and all our listeners. So that's that's the way that I, I you know, recharge. So thank you for that question. That was a great question. All right. So before we close out, Gentlemen, I know I did put your, your Twitter handles here in the chat. They will be on the show notes and so on. But Zach, if you can let our audience members know how they can go ahead and connect with you, uh, please make sure you share out, you know, that info. Yeah, Twitter. Twitter is definitely, I would say, the best um, best way to connect. But I also have a professional teacher Instagram, which is at Zach Rondo. Um, and I love love connecting with people there as well. And then Grace and I have been working on, uh, we launched a new website, uh, that hopefully this summer we'll have some time to add some more things to, and that's expert effect edu.com. Um, and that's where we share. We also use that hashtag expert effect edu, um, on social media to try to share out, uh, share out different things. Excellent. Thank you. Grayson, how about yourself? So yeah, Twitter is a great place. Uh, we'll be sharing some pictures from Zach's elementary school visit later today. Uh, my handle is gmckinney2. And then I also set up an Instagram account um, for our, our books, which is at uh, experteffectedu. So those are two great places to see pictures of, uh, of how we're putting this into practice. Uh, we share resources like if we see, you know, Flipgrid's putting on a live event, we'll 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 help them promote it so that teachers can take advantage of those. All kinds of good resources on both of those platforms. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, it has been an honor. It has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join me on my show and to be able to share the amazing work that you're doing, to be able to hear your story and to be able to have our educators that are listening, creators that are listening uh, to your story so they can go ahead and connect with you as well. I really appreciate all the knowledge nuggets you shared. And I definitely want to thank all our uh, audience members that joined us live. We've got Roxy who says, great show. Thank you all. We've got Lois also. We've got Alex, Mel, and John. Thank you all for joining live. And for those of you that will be uh, catching this on the replay, thank you as always from the bottom of my heart for all of your support. Please make sure that you stop by our website, guys, myedtech.life, myedtech.life. Check out this episode and previous episodes as well. Uh, get yourself some PD from wonderful experts in their field. And you can also stop by and drop us a review. Let us know what we're doing great. Let us know what we can work on. I'm always looking for feedback so we can always bring you the best each and every single time. And also, don't forget to stop by our new merch store. We've got some new merch for you. We know summer's here, so maybe you're looking for some loungewear or you're looking for a way to support one of your favorite podcasts. Stop by, buy a shirt, buy whatever it is that you love. We would definitely appreciate the support. But as always, from the bottom of my heart, you know, thank you so much for filling my heart with being able to do this. And Zach, 
And uh, Grayson, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate you all. Continue doing the work that you're doing because we definitely need more teachers and wonderful innovators such as yourself to inspire others like myself and those that will be listening and watching. Thank you as always. And don't forget, my friends, as always, like I always say, until next time, stay techie.